Permission management, as we saw in the previous lab, is not entirely too tricky. Just getting over that hurdle of translating numbers to characters that represent read, write, and execute. But the more tricky part really comes when you start having to consider which users should and shouldn't access what, and which groups are required for that level of permission control. So in this lab, we're going to learn how to create users and then demonstrate how some users can't access certain files based on their permissions. Let's dive in. First, we just need to make sure that that precious file from last lab still exists and should still be here with the level of permissions for just the owner and it should have some basic text inside as well too. So at this point, only the Ubuntu owner should have read, write, and execute. So now we need another user account. And in order to do that, we need administrator privilege, or in this case, we need to be the root user. And we can use the sudo command to elevate our permissions if our account can elevate to the root user. So let's take a look in that inside the man page and see how this actually works. So in the sudo man page, we can see that this command allows us to execute commands as the super user or another user as specified by the security policy. And that is set differently inside of the system. We're not gonna look at that yet, but what we can do to verify if we can become the sudo user as root, we can take a look at the tac l flag over here. And so what this indicates is that if there's no command specified, then it should just list the allowed and forbidden commands for which user it can actually invoke. So let's go and actually try to run this sudo tac l command and see what happens. And you're gonna hear people pronounce this differently. It can be called sudo as well too. I go with sudo, just like judo, it's a little bit easier. And if we look at the command now of running sudo tac l, it indicates that we can perform all types of actions as all users. So for the Ubuntu user, we here have actually set the controls on this box so that the Ubuntu user can actually sudo as root and perform all actions by them. And you're not gonna see that information here. It's inside of another security configuration file called the sudoers file. And we're not gonna get too much into that because that can cause a lot of headache and it's pretty advanced. So what we can do here to demonstrate is let's run the sudo touch command. And by putting sudo in front, it's gonna execute touch as our elevated user. So let's just call a file elevated permission file and then hit enter. And now what we can do is actually check the permissions of this file and something different's gonna jump out. It's actually now owned by the root user in the root group. So thus our sudo command that we're running in front of another command starts to execute that command as the root user. So thinking back on our permissions, the RW set in the front is only for root. That means only root can write to it. So let's try to echo some contents into this file now, just as Ubuntu, and we get permission denied. And it's incredibly important to pay attention to these error codes. So let's try and just put sudo in front of this command and see what happens. And we still get permission denied. And so this is really interesting here, and these errors actually make sense. So let's try to walk through why this is happening. Well, remember for a moment that little redirector there, the greater than sign, that's putting the hello into the file itself. When we run sudo echo hello, what's happening is that that command itself is being executed with elevated permission, but then after the redirect, that elevated permission stops. It's only pertaining to the left-hand side of that command. So in order for us to actually go ahead and execute this command as one entire pseudo statement, we're going to have to wrap all of that, the echo hello portion into the elevator permission file. We have to wrap that inside of quotes and give it to another process. So what we can do is run pseudo bash and bash is our shell that we're currently in. So if we run a pseudo bash shell, and give that bash shell the statement of echo hello into the permission file. And we can do that with a tax C. Tax C says run bash with this line of code inside of whatever you give it inside of quotes. So if we do this now, it actually executes successfully. And like with anything with Linux, it's always a little confusing at first. So let's go over that again. Pseudo bash tax C is one statement. And then the echo hello into elevator permission file is another statement. And that statement right there is getting executed with pseudo permissions. As opposed to this command, the left-hand side is the only pseudo portion 
and then it terminates right at that redirector and it doesn't go inside the elevator permission file as a result. And that's something that I just wanted to clarify because I want you to understand why error codes are doing what they're doing. And just to relieve a little bit of pressure, this is only something that will get in the way when we start having these redirectors, these operators that we've been talking about slowly. When we just need to run a simple command without redirection, it will give us an error and let us know if we need higher permission. So let's say we wanted to just remove the file. This one is easy. We can just put sudo rm, the file name, and it'll complete. No errors, no additional bash required, and all that good stuff. All right, so now that we covered some of the basics of sudo, I should be able to say at this point forward that whenever we need to run a command with elevated permission, like creating users, deleting users, all I would need to then express is that we need to run that with sudo permissions. So let's do that. Let's create a user, and we need to do that with sudo permissions. So we can use the add user command. And of course, if we just run it as is, we're going to get an error, right? There, see, only the root user may add a user or group to the system. And now it should give us a cue and say, okay, I just need to run this with sudo permission. So I'll run this as sudo add user Samwise. All right, so we've got Samwise on the system because he's going to try to take our precious. And we can see that some things immediately appeared. We have a new group. We have a new user with ID 1001. Remember how I mentioned that 1000 is that first user. And now as we're adding users and groups, it's now incrementing by one. And we can also see that there's a home directory created for Samwise as well too, under home. And that's how Ubuntu's was created. And now we have to enter a password and it may look like nothing is there, but it's just hidden. There are characters being typed. So give a password, something simple because no one else will access it. So maybe even just Samwise as the password, whatever is easier for you. And then fill out some basic information. You don't really need to put in a name and additional information, but I'll just put the name for now and then hit Y when you're ready. Awesome. So that's, that's a user creation, pretty straightforward. We've now created Samwise on the system. Now we need to get another shell open as the Samwise user. So in order to do that, let's first drag this terminal to one side, and then let's open up another terminal and let's drag that onto the other side so we can have a side-by-side -side comparison of what's actually happening. All right, so now we need to actually log in as the Samwise user over here. And in order to do that, we need to use the su command. And this is to run a command with substitute user and group ID. So in order for us to actually run a full shell terminal with the su command, we can actually use a bit of a trick. The trick is that if we don't specify any flags after the su command, it will actually interpret it to just completely change to that user and just run a persistent shell as that user account. So let's go ahead and actually try and do that. If we run su samwise, it'll prompt us for the password. And it's going to assume now that we're just inside of a Samwise shell as the name has changed. And that's kind of the beauty of the terminal is that it's just so much easier to operate in context of whatever you need to with just simple lines of text. Whereas with the desktop, we would need to do a full new login session. Okay, so where is this user on the box right now? Well, if we do PWD, it hasn't changed the directory. We're actually still inside of home Ubuntu and not of the home Samwise folder. Okay, so now let's do a couple things. Let's actually go and check out Samwise's home folder, which now exists under the home directory, and let's check out the groups. Samwise belongs to his own native group as we saw in the user creation. And the home folder, well, it's empty. New users by default, in this case, don't actually get any files in their home folder. Okay, so let's get back to task now and let's try and access that precious file inside of the Ubuntu home folder and see if this file permission actually worked the way as intended. If we just check the permissions from Samwise account, we can see only Ubuntu has full read, write, and execute. And if we try to cat the file now, we'll get a straight up denied. Perfect. So permissions are set. It's working as intended. Easy enough to set and easy enough to separate so that only we can access what we want. And now for some more practice, let's go and change the permissions. Let's make Precious accessible. Let's change it for full permission to everyone. So Shamad 707 Precious file. Let's go back over to the Samwise terminal now. And we can run ls al and see that right away the permissions update. So it's fast. It's instant. And if we try to cat it, now we can read it. So that's just a good demonstration how the permissions actually work. 
and we should be able to also write to it. So let's go and append some text. Let's put something nefarious inside there and just say that it's mine now and leave a little signature that Samwise was here. And let's just append that to the file and see what happens. Catting the file now to see the contents of it should show an appended text and boom, it's there. So we're good to go. We're able to now edit and write to this file because we were granted the permissions to do so. Now we're done here. So if we want to leave this shell, we type exit and watch what happens. This is a little bit different. It actually just brings us back to the Ubuntu user. And there's a reason for that. Remember how I mentioned that running the SU command with Samwise, all what it did was it just created an instance, if you will, that said, I am now gonna run all of these future commands, whatever you give me, as the Samwise user. But it didn't terminate the Ubuntu shell process. So when we type an exit, instead of closing the terminal, it closes that instance. It closes that additional layer that we created. And that's why it brings us back to the Ubuntu user. So with that, let's actually just close that shell. We don't need it anymore on the right-hand side. And what we do want to do is it's time to say goodbye to Samwise, and we need to learn how to delete a user. So for that, we can actually use the del user command. Let's clear our screen and get working with that. We can run a little what is command on the del user just so that we have an idea specifically what it says from the man page. Just as you would guess, removing a user, nothing too surprising there. And what we can also do is try to run it and we're gonna see, yep, there's that error, right? Anything with user administration requires root. So now we just do a sudo del user Samwise and Sam's off back to the Shire. And last but not least, a little bit of cleanup. Let's go and just actually remove our precious so that no one else can take it from us. And that's really it for the basics of creating and removing users on the command line. So pretty straightforward. And you've seen now in this lab how certain permissions can be set to protect users from doing things that they shouldn't or just ensuring confidentiality between different users that we can only see and do the things that we're supposed to do on a system.